Well, good morning, folks. It's John again. We're out in the shop. In today's video, I'd like to talk about larger back saws. And to demonstrate some of those saws, I'm going to do some sample mortise and tenon joints that we're doing. Let's talk just briefly about mortise and tenon joints. For joining two pieces of wood together, you're going to need a mortise. So a mortise is a shaped hole. On this particular piece, it's actually a through mortise, so it goes all the way through. You could have through or blind. Blind means it doesn't go all the way through. This particular one I just did quickly with a hollow chisel mortiser. And there are a variety of ways to remove that wood and get that shaped mortise hole. To go in the mortise, then we're going to cut a tenon on the end of a workpiece. So this is a, a sample tenon I've, I've cut by hand just using saws and a, a plane and a chisel to clean it up. I usually cut the mortises first. You're removing wood from the center of a piece usually. This is actually what weakens the joint because you're removing wood. A lot of times you follow the rule of thirds. Take the thickness of the workpiece divided in three. That's your ideal quote unquote mortise size or width. So this stock is about seven eighths. I could make the mortise a quarter inch or five sixteenths. It's right in that, that neighborhood. I chose to go with 5 16 because in this pine it gives you a little thicker tenon that's going to be more robust. Ideally if you're doing 5 16 you'd want 15 16 inch stock, but if you're down to 3 quarter then you'd want quarter inch. So it's a balancing act. You, you kind of have to look at what wood you're using, what application the mortise will be stressed in, and you can kind of make that judgment call. For this particular mortise and tenon, again it is a through tenon, so that mortise goes all the way through. And I could just glue it, I could put a pin in there to prevent the tenon from sliding back out the mortise. Or the nice thing is on a through tenon, you can actually wedge it. The mortise I'm cutting these tenons for, I have this cut, and when I'm marking out my tenon stock, I'm using a marking gauge. So on the end of this board, you can see I've already marked out my joints. And I did that with a marking gauge. This is my little tight mark marking gauge. Mark those lines to get them darker. I've just ran a pencil down them just so you can see them a little bit better. And you'll notice I didn't draw out all of the joint quite yet. This board is wider than the mortise. So after I make these initial cheek cuts, I'm going to have to go back and remove that material as well. But we're going to do that in a later step. Do the hard part first and then uh, work back from there. I like to tip this forward a little bit because when you're cutting it by hand, you have to be able to see your, your lines to know where you're cutting. So again, start on the corner and I usually work my way until I get just to this edge. I can't see down here, so I'm not going to, to cut down there. But now I have to finish off this cut, so we'll kind of be doing an angled cut. If I stood this straight up in the vise, you could achieve the same thing. Uh, that's not quite straight. Right there. So you could cut across the top, but then as you're cutting, you're having to stoop to bring it down. So that's why I tip the workpiece just a little bit. Bring that up just. So I'm, I'm naturally just sawing as my body likes to, and I'm... Uh, manipulating the workpiece to make me comfortable. There we got right down on the line. Now, this side has been cut. This is not. So I'm going to turn this workpiece around, angle it again. So that second cut, I am angling that as well, just using my natural cutting position. When it gets down to the very bottom, I don't want to go past my knife lines for my depth. So now I might stand this up, double check both sides. Okay. 
double check this. And we have the basic shape of the tenon sawed out. So the next step on this would be to remove this and remove this, fit this so it fits the mortise, and then trim away any extra to get it to fit. Going back to the saws, typically when people get into any kind of hand tool joinery, the first really premium saw they'll get is probably a dovetail saw. These are some examples of uh, the dovetail saws I like to use. Blades are about anywhere from eight to 10 inches long. On these particular ones, they're nine. And you compare that to the saw I was using to cut the tenons, and you can see it's, it's a lot smaller saw. A lot smaller saw, a lot finer toothed saw. And this is a 14 inch. This is an older Lee Nielsen. And it is a 10 PPI rip. Pretty aggressive teeth on it. You look, might look at a big saw like this, or even uh, this is a, a Lee Valley that's even bigger than the saw I was using. And it might look cumbersome, especially, you know, these tenons aren't huge that I'm working on. It's not, uh, you know, the, the biggest stock you've ever seen. But what I find with a, a larger uh, saw for joinery is that it's easier to steer. The saw plate, first of all, is, is taller, so you can cut further down into a joint. With a small dovetail saw like this, you're only going to saw down about an inch before the back bottoms out and you can't saw anymore. So the taller the saw, the larger the joint you can do, but also the taller the saw, the better you can get an idea of if you are staying plumb or not. So it's, it's easier, I think, by feel and, and sight to look at the saw and go, oh, I'm not cutting straight. Uh, also, with the longer blade, it's a little bit easier um, on your body, I think, to make repetitive cuts over and over if you're making a lot of these. On a smaller saw, if we're just cutting, you know, if we tried to cut it with my little dovetail saw, you only get eight, nine inches of teeth. So it's gonna, it's, it's a lot of little icka, icka, icka <laughs> sawing. With a longer saw, longer strokes, cuts faster, and then you can get on to the next step. This uh, I saw again, this is the Largely Valley Veritas. I believe it's 16, let's double check. So this, yep, this is a 16, nine TPI rip. You might remember the last one I showed you was a 10 PPI, not TPI. TPI would be tooth per inch, PPI would be point per inch, or the very point of the tooth. So actually, these two saws have the same exact tooth pattern. This is a 10 PPI, this is a nine TPI, or tooth per inch. So I don't know why <laughs> there can't be universal consolidation, but I, um, if one manufacturer calls it that, we're just, I'm gonna stick with it so there isn't confusion if you ever go to look for these. Uh, this saw and this saw look exactly the same, except this is a crosscut saw, this is a rip saw. So you might have noticed how fast that thing cut. If I try to use a crosscut saw on an operation like this, where it's more of a, a ripping, it'll cut, and this saw is nice and sharp, so it will cut, but it just won't cut as fast as uh, the saw that was designed just to rip. The first problem is there are more teeth per inch on this. The, this one is a 12, where that is a nine. So it's gonna cut slower, and I find it doesn't track quite as well. You can do it, it's just gonna be a little bit more frustrating. So um, that is one thing to look out for. Uh, this is more of a carcass saw size. I think of this as a, a large uh, dovetail saw almost, but this is a 12 TPI rip as well. So this is 12 teeth to the inch. You'll notice, again, we're getting into the neighborhood of we don't have a lot of usable blade space between the teeth and the back. 
So it'll cut and cut nicely if you're used to it. We have a, this is another Lee Nielsen. This is actually a 14 PPI cross cut. And again, it's sharp, but once you get it buried uh, where you're, you know, in a full cut, it's really slow. This is um, a custom one I had made for me. This is running about eight teeth to the inch. So it will cut very, very fast. And it's a heavier saw. So as I'm cutting with this, and I'm cutting with a lot of the saws, I'm not really pushing down on the workpiece so much as I am just tr trying to hold the saw as straight in the cut and as plumb as possible while I move my arm back and forth. Let the saw do the work. Um, let the, the sawdust clear out of the teeth. The fewer teeth to the inch you have, or points to the inch you have, the faster you're going to be able to saw. But controlling the saw is a, a little bit harder when it's cutting this fast too. If you look at that cut, this side is the side I just did. Oh, this side you see where I don't quite have a, a straight cut, I use two different saws on it. And, you know, now that I turn it around, this side is the last one I did, nice and straight, clean. This looks like an angry beaver was kind of going at it. So it's all, it's practice and it is somewhat the tool. It is somewhat the tool. Uh, one thing I do want to mention as well, uh, Let's, uh, let's use this just to hold the saw. Um, my natural grip, when you hold a saw, I'm a little bit tipped out, but one tip that I've kind of forced myself to do is to tuck my elbow, and that brings the saw to plumb. So when I'm, when I'm sawing, I'm not really pushing down into the cut so much as I am just trying to be very cognizant of holding this thing as straight as I possibly can in the cut. Now that we have our sample tenon cheeks cut out, let's saw away the waste. On this particular workpiece, I already had one side of the tenon cut away from the operation that we were doing, where it's full width of the workpiece. These were the ends that we just cut off. Now I need to remove these pieces of material. A little bit harder to see, but I do have a knife line cut, and that will tell me where I need to cut to. So again, here I'm just using a pencil to run down in that knife line. Using a bench hook to hold it while I saw. And let's start with the first saw I used. So this again is a rip saw. It isn't going to enjoy cross cutting necessarily, but it will do it. I do want to stay off the line a little bit because as a rip saw, it'll leave a little bit of a ragged cut. If you're very light starting the cut, that helps. Light means I'm not really bearing down on the saw, I'm just moving it back and forth to let the teeth kind of settle in. And I'm really also trying to avoid cutting through my tenon. So I'm gonna bring the saw in from the side, double check my, my depth. And I got a little bit right there. Let's see if I can just, yeah, I can just pop that on. So there we have that removed. Let's do the other side. Uh, let's go to this big rip saw.
This is the large Lee Valley, but it's the cross cut. I should have just shaded these all in in the first place. There. A lot easier to start. Let's double check. And then finally, uh, this one is probably not a good idea. It'll work, but it's not a good idea. The first thing I notice is just getting it started, it really blows that grain out. It does cut fast, but you kind of have to, you're just holding on for dear life on that thing. So we have these cut. Let's try to get a close up of what that face grain looks like. And you can kind of see the angled cut down, turn it around, finish with the angle cut. So it's kind of a crisscross. Switch ends. So the set of your teeth, how aggressive this is, and how Oh yeah, this one's kind of the butchered one. How well you're, you're sawing and how well your saw is capable of sawing is going to dictate what your finished face grain looks like. Now on this, you can also see I'm not on my knife line. When I sawed it, I stayed off the knife line. To clean this up, I'm going to use a shoulder point. See, I didn't quite saw down to the line here. I'm off that line. When I flip it over to the other side, I'm close to the line. So as I'm planing, this is a, a shoulder plane. The blade uh, comes to either side. So the blade is full width of the plane body. You can plane into corners. When I'm planing with this, this I'm almost down to the line. This I have extra material. So I'm gonna concentrate initially on getting rid of this little extra high spot along this edge. Got a little ways to go. So what you might notice about as I'm cleaning this up, if I can get it up in the light, my initial cut at the bench was right on the line. It was when I turned it over that I got a little bit off the line on the backside. So that's my high spot right now. We're almost down to that spot. Um, as far as planing this, what I'm typically doing, this bore or this tenon is just a little bit longer than two widths of my plane. So I make my initial cut right in the corner, work over, and then I just have a little bit right there that I need to deal with. If you cut too much away, you're going to be loose in your mortise. So you want to kind of sneak up on your finished thickness. Here where we have to trim up to that knife line. If I just go straight across with this thing, I'm probably going to blow out the end grain right there. So what I'm going to start by doing is actually cut a little bit at an angle to the knife line. I'm not going past the knife line. I'm just nipping that corner. You could also do that with a chisel. And you might see now while I'm doing this shoulder cut second, I have a nice flat smooth surface to rest the side of my plane on. So you can see how we've cleaned that shoulder up, we've planed this face, has a little bit of saw marks on that, but again I want to sneak up on my finished thickness. And this side is straight off the saw. On this end, I've marked this to the width that my finished tenon needs to be. And again, I did that with a marking gauge. So I, my marking gauge 
marks here, marks here, and then I darkened in the lines with a pencil. Now that I have this marked out, I can stand this up in the vise, and then we're going to cut straight down on either side to remove this and remove this. You want to be careful again not to go too far uh, to cut past the shoulder of this so it shows up on your finished workpiece. And there you are. Now, if you are feeling confident you can just come along and this is again harder to start with a more aggressive rip saw oh, I think I bungled it you can come in from the side and just cut that off if you if you really want to keep it in the vise and and just do it that way my advice is to get a, a more finely toothed saw where you can just come in and cut that away Another uh, way to do it, if, if this isn't too wide of a workpiece, is to just stand it up in your bench hook and make that last little trim piece. Now the last little part to trimming this off, we're really too narrow to run any kind of plane on that, like my shoulder plane. So this last little trim piece, I'll simply do with a chisel. So I'll come in and on this one, if you remember my sample joint on this side that we just showed, I have planed out this side. I have not planed out this side, so these shoulders aren't lined up. But on this one, where I had it done already, I have this side and this side to finish depth. So all I'm going to do is use uh, that as a guide for my chisel. To finish off this little trim cut right here. Now to the other side. This is the side I, I did with the, their larger saw and I skipped it just a little bit. I see I have some tooth, teeth marks right there that aren't the end of the world you could trim those off but that is cutting a tenon by hand if you've made it this far I appreciate it uh, we've done some sample mortise and tenon joints I'm hoping what I've talked about with the saws makes sense uh, they all certainly work and I brought out a variety of saws today but certainly nothing wrong with buying a beater and starting out with that getting good at it and then graduating up what I found when I was um, getting ready for this video is I had to go around in uh, various places and dig all my saws back out to show you because uh, once I get going, I typically just use one or two of these and the rest are in storage or in undisclosed locations. So again, uh, don't be afraid of a, a larger back saw. They're very useful for cutting all kinds of uh, joints, large and small. And uh, thanks again for watching. We'll catch you next time.